Boots of Zealous Command. Only used by Paladin. Zealous Command bonus. So 20 percent more area for the aura. An officer in the Darkosi Paladini of Old Valia first wore these. It was said that those under her command knew her by the sound of her approach and stood a, a little straighter in her presence. She was uh, known throughout the Order for her inspirational leadership. By the way, in case it helps with deciding on party members, a lot's companion quests, uh, quests start in the City of Defiance and Saganis uh, doesn't continue there. Okay. Ways of the Mountain Top. Only usable by Chanters. So area for those as well. Dwarven Chanters of the White, Re uh, White March are uh, said to have mastered projection, projection techniques uh, to such degree that they can trigger distant avalanches with their voices. Whether or not this specific rumor is true, they are known to chant between peaks and across rugged valleys, exchanging uh, messages with their brethren across great distances. This amulet was forged by an ancient order of druids in the White March, the precursors to the Ethyl Noel of Twin Elms. It was uh, worn and passed down from one watchman to the next, men and women who stood guard atop the high peaks, ready to warn their fellows of approaching armies. <clears throat> Small uh, mistake I made there, I was like, white, uh, white run, suddenly, suddenly Skyrim with these shoutings. Grappling with pry bar, hammer and chisel, torches and lockpicks. Hmm. Let's let's see how much garbage we have. Actually, I could sell these uh, fine armors. I, I mean, I I'm using everything already, so these are all all for nothing. Yeah, we can actually buy several of those weapons and. Uh, gear from this guy and we will um what was the last one fine hatchet yeah I don't need these fine weapons I'm gonna keep keeping the special ones I guess yeah, 9,000. Yeah, that's gonna buy me some some stuff. I'm gonna buy... I'm gonna buy the light armor, at least. This is expensive. 10,000. Sadly, I don't really have any use for any of these weapons. I mean, I don't have a 200 user at the moment. I don't have a pike user. The druid is using a spear, but he's also shape-shifting, so... And the spear doesn't really help. And I don't need those, because I'm not using a chanter or a, or a paladin at the moment. I think I'll just buy the light armor. I'll keep those in mind. Get some money. I think I'm getting this on myself. Holy... It's very, very blue. <laughs> Let's take a look at this. We may have some uh, overlapping... Yeah, the ring of protection is suppressed now. It's fine. Is there any last to actually have something? Why is that suppressed? Oh, the Alot Slater armor does the same. 
So this this ring on you is actually totally useless. There you go. Bigger area for the healer. Similar bonuses uh, don't stack. So it only takes the stronger one. So you should take a look at these. And when you see the suppressed, you should replace that if you can. But I get the feel and fortitude from that ring, so I'm gonna keep the even the suppressed one, even though the reflex is getting higher from there. There you go. You need gear badly. Uh, can you actually uh, access the... Oh, I need to be in the... Keep to... Yeah, yeah, armor's way. Good point. Armor or survival within in some form would be beneficial for all of my characters, especially... Especially me and the priest and I guess Sagani and Hiravas as well, but Hiravias as well but mainly me and the healer need uh, something I think if I find a, a nice robe or something the crazy priest is, is the one to get it in Milo so we've done done the armory see the grieving mother The woman looks briefly through you as if she doesn't know you're there. This middle-aged peasant woman is dressed in a brown leather cloth draped over down to her knee. Her hands are working as a separating stringy colorless vegetables in a pile before her, stripping the heads of the long fibrous stems with a paring knife. She discards the stem one by one, placing the heads of the vegetables into a small cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you. As you approach, you are not sure she even knows you are there. Excuse me? The woman doesn't respond. She's uh, stripping the heads of the vegetables with a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she heard you. Study the woman. At first glance, it's, she seems uh, nothing more than a middle-aged woman. Unremarkably, unremarkable, maybe uh, less stern than most, who seem uh, more focused on weaving in her lap than her surroundings. Yet you suddenly notice she's not stripping the vegetables before her any longer. She's weaving, and the vegetables, vegetable pots are now missing. She still pays you no mind. Her brown locks are torn and snagged from lack of washing, like many of the town folk you've seen. There is a strange blur to her. Even the motions of her hands seem to be playing with the threads that lack color in, the sh in a shape that lacks interest. It may be that she's a... Uh, half-minded or deaf, but something feels wrong. As you watch her knitting uh, takes on an odd cadence, and you have a terrible suspicion that something lurks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Focus on woman. <laughs> Focus. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks, Edmund. I'm wondering, did I put something on the chanter guy, which I might want to give on someone else, like the Hiravias? Her brown hair is long, almost impossible, possibly to the length of her hands. As you follow the streams of her locks downwards, the hairs become long and black, splitting off into threads of black and silver, wrapping around her hands. She's uh, forming a soul cradle with threads, braiding a net in front of uh, you. Her fingers are long and sharp like a series of knitting needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and the black strands of her hair weave together, with silver predominating as a highlight, the shadow, black shadowing it. And suddenly you are calm. You are on a plateau, almost the height uh, of a tower, several stories higher. The plateau is uh, like a table lying beneath clear sky, and beneath the plateau, surrounding it in all directions, a forest, hazy with mist, although whether it is uh, actual mist or distance or a recollection. Resting in the curve of a natural arch uh, above you is a great copper bell. Half again the size of a man, hanging at attention as if looking down on you and and the event unfolding before you. The plateau is soaked with sun, and the rocks beneath uh, 
you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. You feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body. Your physical contours have changed along with the surroundings. And you hear a soft series of chimes, like wind chimes. At the sound, uh, the scene gains color and texture, as if the sound is beckoning you gently forward, filling your senses and thoughts, like a mist rolling softly in the sealed chamber and focus the chimes. Chimes coax you deeper into the memory, and you are certain it is a memory, a warm one. You are on, you are on the stone of, a plat of the plateau, your knees on the warm te texture of the ground, silver white, shimmering like Adra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in, a, in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrist, and your hands. Your hands are in motion, weaving, not thread, but gathering, tenderly moving along the first movements of the Berat's wheel. Your hands are wet, your hands are upon the flesh of the newborn of a newborn child, and you can feel the groaning of the tiny head turning in your grip, its head slick, wet from the womb. The hands you are wearing in hibiting have done this many times, and they have practiced uh, they are practiced and confident. You can feel these ten pains in your own head as the head emerges, a stream of fluid from the womb helping the newborn slide forward, and the woman's labored breathing, breathing crying out. Focus on the child, the movement of, of your hands. As your hands move, you hear the sound of chimes, clear, cutting through the haze of memory. You cannot see where they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as a comfort uh, of what you are... Oh, of that you are certain. Draw, draw the child forth. And coaxed by your hands, every movement causing the chimes to sound again. Almost eagerly, the child comes forth, and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of a soft wet rope. No, an un umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. You are holding a small child, still wet from the womb, before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul. The ringing of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with. Uh, with its uh, welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges, as if you are weaving a soul from within a soul, but it is there, it is alive. The woman before you is weeping, and at her first cry, her hands reach out for it. Surrender the child. You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before. And as your hands move, the chimes echo the movement, and you realize that the chimes are hanging from the cords on your wrists, and where they, where once they echoed in memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child, to be its first gentle greeting into the world, a soothing sound guided by the tender motion of your wrists. You are helping to weave its thoughts, its perception, and the experience. The experience. The woman laughs with ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat. Her emotions uh, seem soothe. Let me drink something quickly. But the physical demand of labor have left her exhausted. But the child is here. The child is safe. And all atop of plateau is uh, peaceful, calm, distant, flattening out as the memory persists. Slowly pull back, retreat from the memory. With effort the scene uh, bleeds of color, and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet, no s yet the sound of chimes re remain. As they exist in the memory, they sound here as well, and they are hanging from the woman braids on the wrists of the woman before you. Even as your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, the sound of the chimes of her wrists are sharp and clear, as if coaxing you back into the real world. The woman stills before you, but she is nothing like a... Uh, what you first saw. She's wearing black, shredded uh, garments that drape over her form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, like a crumbled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you see that her hair is draped across the front of her face like a veil. What you first saw of her was a mental clamor of some sort, unconscious, and you realize what you see is not what the world sees, and you are perhaps first to see her true self. Still, you don't sense a threat in realization. If anything, you feel a sense of relief from the figure. You can hear her thoughts, and she is glad to be at last be seen. 
What did you do to me? I am seen, but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There is a light touch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the touch, reaching up to the air between you. You hear the chime on her wrist sound softly. Her hand moves uh, as if uh, pantomiming the resting on your cheek at distance, and she speaks softly and slowly. Your memories. Cadence of wheels on a caravan track. Fever. Questions by running water. Violence in a night's campfire. Arrows in the dark. And fleeing. Falling rock and cracking stone. And a storm. The storm. The storm that brushed you. Did its screaming wake you from your mind's cradle? Your memory of it is painful. Its cry is difficult to ignore. It's like a child. Many children crying out. I encountered... <laughs> Let's start it again. I encountered a Biabak, yes. And it did something to me. Her hand withdraws slightly. The chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands uncertainly, as if she has been uh, sitting for some time, or is it too weak to bear her own weight? You notice her cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt, yet while her stance is weak, she seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It is almost a question. You suddenly realize she does not seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. The image on the plateau, yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you are surprised she doesn't didn't feel you there. To see me is a rare gift. A watcher's gift. Oh, cipher uh, bonus. Let's go with the cipher option, because that's my class. It felt like a pathway between our minds, but strange, gentle. So many questions, thoughts, whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you, deep beneath your thoughts, yet muted and secret like an underground river we cannot Jesus, tell if it is carving new channels or eroding what keeps your true strength buried her is uh, sounds are very strange the fact that you could hear it at all survive it is something few have ever done your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch as it allowed you to reach out to mine there is a silence, and although it seems uh, to last for a, but a heart heartbeat in your thoughts, it stretches out between the two of you, like a pool between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and then you realize she wants to ask you a question, yet can't form the words, as if uh, assembling them is painful, or there, is simply, or there simply are not enough pieces. Assemble the thought. Do you wish to travel with me? You feel a wave of fear, gusted with the strength of relief, although oddly, her expression does not change. Then the fear dissipates, and you feel strength and uncer un un uncertainty, as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you, and the calm sky looks down upon you. Okay. You are a very strange follower, so get him, uh, her in there. Oh, he's she's a cipher as well. Another cipher. Grieving mother. Yeah. She's a cipher like me. Interesting. What was uh, her quest? The dream and memory. Learn the, learn the grieving mother has passed. When I first encountered the Grieving Mother on the road, I experienced the dream, or was it the memory, of childbirth. Perhaps the Grieving Mother herself can explain what I saw. Your thoughts must flow deeply. Indeed. Your mind comes bearing questions, Watcher. What are ciphers? Ciphers are basically... Uh, they use soul magic. Uh, basically like a scientist would use. They have a lot of uh, like mind-affecting stuff and... Spells like that. So. 
Let me let me see if it if I have a better oops. Better explanation for you. Uh journal. I think there's in the cyclopedia. Is there an explanation of ciphers here? I guess not. But anyways, that, yes, bad voodoo. <laughs> no, they're, they're like a Zionist kind of guys. They affect the soul and learn the soul stuff. Read the soul. So basically drunks? Yes. <laughs> More or less. Your mind comes bearing questions, Watcher. I had a few uh, I had questions for you. You addressed me as a watcher when we met. Do you know what a watcher is? There is a slow chill, and for a moment it seems uh, as if she is going to fade from your vision, as if she didn't, if, uh, as if she can't bear to be seen. The title came unbidden. I do not know why I spoke of it, yet it seemed the right mantle, a familiar one. Yet I do not know from where it came. If I have given offense. Oddly enough, it feels like uh, she's not speaking to you. It feels like she's speaking to an audience. The air takes on a curious edge, a chill, which persists for a sharp moment, then fades into a dull fear. If I have given offense, forgive me, forgive me. You, you would know more than I. Have you encountered watchers before? I do not know. It is an odd feeling. I do not know where it stems from. It was a word that arose when you saw me. It is said watchers see much uh, that others do not, and I have been hidden from the eyes of the others for, for some time. Let me ask you about something else. How is it no one can see you? Their eyes see me, but their minds will not remember past the call. A call? My face is like the call of a newborn, hiding the face beneath, and for my body, I am able to wrap myself as a mother cradling her child. I am here, as you see me, but to them, their eyes see only the cloak that I wear. A peasant mother, dirty, shabby, not worth knowing. Nice. As a watcher, you see more than others. To the eyes of most, I am as unseen as the spirits you share memories with. How are you able to affect minds? I direct, divert the flow of their sentence down a di different path to a place easily forgotten. It is not unwelcome when one does not desire the presence of others. The surface of their minds register a figure, but the memory slips away. They see a woman, but there is no desire for conversation, no desire for any questions, and I have none to ask. I want to discuss something different. When we first met, how was I able to enter your dream? I do not know. What... what do you speak of? If you were in my thoughts, I could not feel your presence, nor do I know what you saw there. As she speaks, you suddenly feel an odd sensation in her mind, as if walking in her thoughts would be as if uh, walking down a back street of merchant stall. The claustrophobia of wooden shelves and canvas tarps made uh, less oppressive by the sheer number of enticing vials and bottles that stretch out to the sides of you. You suddenly realize that uh, whether she permits it or not, you could uh, enter her dream and observe it without ever her ever knowing. And in response, your hand twitches. There is a feeling that you could simply pick up a while, taste it, sample it, and keep the memory as your own. And suddenly, you find yourself back in her, your present thoughts, though you were uh, away for about a moment. She seems unaware of your diversion of thought. It may be one of your gifts, an ability to walk in memories as easily as someone walks upon the ground. May I try again? Perhaps you would like to hear what I saw in your memories. A mixture of curiosity and fear wells up between you. She raises her left high hand. The chimes at her wrists, quelling their eyes, 
within her. She's frightened, but curious and curiously anchors her. And what did you see in my memories? I would hear you speak of them. Mm. The dream, the memory I saw upon meeting you, it was you helping give uh, birth to a child. There is a silence, and as you breathe, uh, as your breath uh, falls still, you hear the faint cry of a child in the distance, a newborn child, almost exactly like what you heard in the dream. As you listen, the grieving mother raises both her hands, as if weaving, her wrist chiming as she does so. In semblance of the gentle turning she provided while the newborn was crowning. Uh, to your surprise, you realize the motion, motions and the words from her memory, even as they are new to you. As she weaves her hands through the air in front of her, the child's uh, cries grow still, yet the sound of the chimes weave, weaves almost hypnotically into your thoughts. The sky seems, to sh seems sharp and clear, and you feel as if you are towering over your surroundings, as if kneeling atop of a great pillar, just as she did in the memory. To your surprise, the grieving mother falls as if her strings were cut and her knees crack hard against the ground. Her hands never cease m moving in the air, the chimes echoing her movements. In a racket voice, you hear her speak. The voice is that of a much older woman than the one before you, harsh, almost desperate. Tell me what you saw. Show me what you saw. Where were you? Cypher. It was in the middle of the forest atop a great plateau. The sky was clear, mist blan blanketing the trees. As she kneels before uh, you on the ground, she whispers to you hoarsely and uh, even fainter with the distance between you. The stone of the plateau. Its color. Tell me its color. It was silver adra, its surface warmed by the sun. As you watch her hands rise before her, she clasps them, then cups them as if feeling them for the first time, and she stares down into the cradle of her hands, and the chimes sound again, twice, as they swing with her movement. And what did these hands hold? A newborn child. There is a sudden intake of breath and then a release. Her eyes blur closed, forming into slits. <coughs> but in the brief glimpse you have uh, of her changing expression, the rippling pain in her feature seems to have smoothed. Uh, she swallows once, twice, and then you feel her again, once again in your thoughts, the rasping husk of her voice swallowed and drawn within her. It was the birthing bell you saw. Has it been so long? Have I forgotten so much? With the words comes a river of impulses, thoughts, as if loosed from the breaking dam. And as your mind uh, wraps the impulse in the words, you realize it is her muscles and her hardened thoughts relaxing and breathing again. There is uh, such an intensity you almost want to step back from the flow, but you find the waves and impul of waves of impulses uh, cause questions to float to the surface. Among them, among them is a name, Watcher. What is the birthing bell? It is a plateau formed of the spirit stone Audra. At its top is set a great bell, cradled in the reaching arm of the plateau. It stirs in the wind, and it sounds for leagues when struck by kith hands. In distant times, the great bell served as a Glanfothan watchtower, perhaps. Why they abandoned it, I do not know. Other men came in time, settlers, and claim the tower as their own. I, in turn, claimed it from them. The pillar became a cradle where I could draw new souls into the world. It's a Finnish accent, Mojo. In your memory, were you helping a woman give birth? Yes. Yet, I believe you only saw a small part of the birthing ritual. It is not all in a moment nor in a day. It is a journey of many years between the child, the mother. <laughs> nice Endermere. Well, it's nice that uh, your class and your stats have such an impact on